Welcome back to New Market Arms. In this video, I'm going to tackle the question of whether or not Confederate generals were traitors. This has come up recently, and there have been some comments by our respected military figures that bothered me, so I wanted to give it my two cents. So here it goes. Here is young Lieutenant of Engineers Robert E. Lee, United States Army, in 1838. Lee graduated second in his class at West Point in 1829. He then went on to a distinguished career in the U.S. Army, receiving brevets for valor during the Mexican War, served as superintendent at West Point, and ultimately resigned his commission as a lieutenant colonel in April 1861. Did this honorable young officer commit treason when he put on this uniform? Here is General Robert E. Lee, Confederate States Army, commander of the Army of Northern Virginia in 1864. He later became General-in-Chief of Confederate Forces in 1865. Here's young Lieutenant of Artillery Thomas J. Jackson, United States Army, during the Mexican War around 1847. He was distinguished for bravery during the Mexican War and served as a professor of natural philosophy and artillery tactics at the Virginia Military Institute, my alma mater, until the start of the Civil War. Did this honorable young officer commit treason when he put on this uniform? Here's Lieutenant General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson in 1863. Architect of the famous Valley Campaign and hero of the Battle of Chancellorsville, where he was mortally wounded by his own troops, dying shortly afterwards in 1863. His Valley Campaign is still studied in military academies around the world. Here's a young lieutenant of cavalry, James Ewell Brown Stewart, U.S. Army in the mid-1850s. He distinguished himself in combat against the Cheyenne in the 1850s and was part of the forces that captured John Brown at Harper's Ferry in 1859, along with Colonel Robert E. Lee, U.S. Army. Did this honorable young man, this officer, commit treason when he put on this uniform? Here is Major General Jeb Stewart commander of the Cavalry Corps, Army of Northern Virginia. He was killed in action at Yellow Tavern in May 1864. Now, I could have put any number of former U.S. officers, U.S. Army officers who later served as officers in the Confederate Army during the Civil War on this list and asked the same question. Were they traitors? This question has come up from time to time, but it stirred me to address it recently when two men I respected commented on it. The first is a statement made by retired Army General Jack Keane a man I served with under the in the 101st Airborne Division. I served under him and is a man that I very highly respected then and I highly respect now. While he stated that he, he did not believe the current U.S. Army post named for Confederate generals should now be changed, he did say that they were named for Confederate generals who committed treason. The second statement was made by Army General Mark Milley, currently the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He's a man that I've only met briefly, but he's also someone that I respect. In his statement, he notes that former U.S. Army officers who later served in the Confederate Army, quote, turned their back on their oath, end quote. Both of these statements bothered me. First of all, I grew up in the South revering these Confederate generals as soldiers in a lost cause for sure, but soldiers of honor nevertheless. I then grew up in the Army revering these same officers, studying their campaigns and battles, and serving on several of the Army posts named for them. Second, as a student of history, these, stu these statements by two respected generals bothered me because they do not comport with my understanding of the history of that time and the context in which these officers lived. So here, I want to take a look at the charge level against these Confederate officers and analyze it. And we're going to start with the oath of office, since that's usually the point upon which an allegation of treason is based, and it's the one expressly mentioned recently by General Milley. The first oath of office for the new United States Army, then called the Continental Army, was given to officers in 1776. This oath was rather specific to renunciation of any allegiance owed to King George III and a promise to defend the 13 United States of America against the king. The oath changed slightly in 1778, but the changes were mostly an attempt to abbreviate the oath and make it shorter. 
It still mirrors the 1776 oath by renouncing any allegiance to George III and an oath to defend the United States. The officer oath changed again in 1789 in response to the adoption of the United States Constitution. For the first time, officers swore to support the new Constitution. The officers then swore to bear allegiance to the United States. But the context and the words here are very important. In reference to the United States, the officer in 1789 swore to serve them, meaning all 13 states, against their enemies or opposers. The officer also promised to obey the orders of the President of the United States, who's commander-in-chief, and the orders of those officers appointed over him. This language is nearly identical to the current officer oath. The oath remained unchanged until 1830 when it was revised again slightly, but it remains very close to the 1789 oath. While the officer swears to bear true allegiance to the United States of America, that definition is not the same as we know it today because that oath goes on to qualify the United States as individual states, hence the oath to serve them against their enemies, referring to the individual states. The officer also swears to obey the orders of the president and the officers appointed over him. Now let's take a look at what treason is. Interestingly, it's the only crime defined by the U.S. Constitution, and it identifies the United States as individual states, not a single federal government, because it says treason consists only of levying war against them, meaning the individual states, or adhering to their enemies. The words them and their denote the individual states in both statutory construction and how the officers themselves viewed their duty at the time. Like any crime, tre treason has elements that must be proved in order to convict someone. There are two elements to the crime of treason. The first is that the defendant must owe allegiance to the government. The second element is that the defendant must intentionally betray that allegiance by levying war or providing aid or comfort to the enemy. If there's no duty of allegiance to the government, then there can be no treason. The operative question then becomes, did those officers in the United States Army who resigned their commission, or even former officers who had left the service before the Civil War began, owe an allegiance to the federal government, to the Union, when their respective states seceded from the Union? The concept is known as expatriation. If someone becomes a citizen of another country, can that person betray or commit treason against the old country? So how was citizenship viewed in 1861? To begin with, the U.S. Constitution does not define citizenship. Citizenship is mentioned four times in the Constitution, but when it is mentioned, it refers to citizens of the various states and citizens of the collective United States. The contemporary view of most in 1861 was the same that Robert E. Lee had, who said, quote, The act of Virginia in withdrawing herself from the United States carried me along as a citizen of Virginia because Virginia's laws and her acts were binding on me. So the view of Americans at that time was that citizenship was specific to the individual state, which was part of a compact of states, which was the Union. Robert E. Lee viewed himself as a citizen of Virginia, and as such, he was duty-bound to follow her, even if that meant leaving the Union. But what about the legal view at the time? In 1866, the Chief Justice of the United States, Salmon P. Chase, said that under the Constitution, secession was not rebellion. While he was referring to the pending trial, a treason trial, of Confederate President Jefferson Davis, who was also a former Army officer, by the way, his view would not be applicable to all Confederate officers, or it would be. And the Chief Justice said of, of uh, Jefferson Davis, we cannot convict him of treason. And that's him saying that as Chief Justice based on the law of treason at the time. This brings us to the importance of context. Now, context is important in all things, and it's no less so when examining history. It's tempting to disregard context and apply all current norms, values, and views to events in the past. And that type of analysis is very much in vogue today, and it's called presentism. But presentism is, frankly, a lazy man's view of history. As noted historian Gordon B. Hinckley once said, I do not fear truth, I welcome it, but I wish all of my facts to be in their proper context. Now, I took a stab at my own saying on the importance of context, and it is that history without context is like a skeleton without skin or a body without a face. You can tell it's a body, but without context, you cannot tell who it was. Context is not only important, but it's critical to understanding the past. 
Now, part of the contest in 1861 are the statistics of those who currently served in 1861 or had served in the U.S. Army, who ultimately served in the Confederate Army. I would point out that while I'm only discussing the U.S. Army and the Confederate Army, the statistics I have reviewed are similar for those in the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Marine Corps who went on to serve in the Confederate Navy and the Confederate Marine Corps. A good representative sample is the composition of the Corps of Cadets at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Then as now, cadet representation was based on congressional appointments, so the geographic representation closely mirrors the U.S. population. In 1861, out of 278 cadets in the Corps at West Point, 86 were from southern states. Of that 86, 65 had resigned and left West Point for their home states in the south by May of 1861. Of the remaining 21 southern cadets, almost all would eventually leave West Point to serve in the Confederate Army. In terms of general officers on both sides of the war, 445 general officers who served in the war were graduates of West Point. Of these, 151 would serve as Confederate generals. I mention these statistics because of what they show is that virtually everyone who served in the U.S. Army and who was from a southern state that seceded from the Union eventually served in the Confederate Army. There are exceptions, such as Union General George Thomas, the Rock of Chickamauga, who was from Virginia and who remained in the United States Army. He is, by, by the way, the most talented Union general officer of the war from my perspective. But there were also exceptions going the other way in which Northern officers ended up serving in the Confederate Army. But the vast majority of those Southerners who wore the uniform of the United States Army before the Civil War eventually served in the Confederate Army. Is it possible that they were all traitors? This brings us back to Robert E. Lee. My considered view is that this young U.S. Army officer, when taken into context, was the same man as this Confederate Army general officer. Indeed, Robert E. Lee's resignation from the U.S. Army and his accepting an appointment as a general in the Confederate Army was entirely consistent with his oath of office as an officer, his view of the Constitution, and his view of the Union. And don't take my word for it, General Ulysses S. Grant felt that the Confederate officers should not be punished for treason after the war. And please also keep in mind that at that time, many in the North did not view Southerners as treasonous or secession as treasonous. There were, however, vocal people on both sides, many of whom at the time did consider them traitors. This brings us to the ultimate question. Why did a majority of dedicated, honorable, highly religious, for the most part, and morally upright U.S. Army officers cast their lot with the Confederacy and take up arms against the Union? I contend that the answer is that these officers, based on the belief at the time in what the United States was and was not, felt both bound by honor and duty to follow their state through secession into the Confederacy. To conclude my review of whether Confederate Army officers were traitors, I do not believe they violated either the spirit or the letter of the oath of office they swore to before the Civil War. These same officers felt their actions were entirely consistent with the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. It's important to remember that the Civil War began only 84 years after the Declaration of Independence. It's also important to note that before the Civil War, people did not refer to the United States as an entity in itself, except only as a government with very limited powers, where most of the power remained with the respective states, hence the Tenth Amendment. When referring to the U.S. before the war, it was referred to as these United States. It would only be referred to for the first time as a singular the United States after the Civil War. Based on reviewing their oaths in the context of citizenship and duty as it existed at the time, I firmly believe that former U.S. Army officers who ultimately followed their states and served in the Confederate Army were honorable and moral men who followed their, their duty as they saw it. I do not believe they were traitors. So that brings us to another question that's currently under active consideration today. And that question is, should we name... Uh, should we rename the current U.S. Army posts that were named for Confederate generals? To answer that question, you again need to look at the historical context when those posts were activated and named. All of the installations were named at a time that was within the living memory of those in the South who lived through Reconstruction, which was a very difficult period in the South, which effects that lingered long afterwards. I would even argue that the effects of Reconstruction lingered until the beginning of World War II. 
Also, at the time these installations were named in honor of Confederate generals, it was done by those in the U.S. government and the U.S. Army as an act of reconciliation with the South, not one that was intended to divide. Finally, the decision to name these posts after Confederate generals was intended to recognize the warrior spirit of those officers and the fighting spirit of Southerners generally. Now, on that point, I'd fully concede that someone didn't do their homework when they named a post for General Braxton Bragg, but that was the intent. Should these posts be renamed? I'm less bothered, honestly, by the idea of renaming Army posts named for Confederate generals than I am labeling all Confederate generals as traitors. But I would echo General Keene, who said generations of soldiers have grown up at Fort Benning, Fort Bragg, Fort Hood, and other posts who know it only as a name. In that sense, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to change the names. The final points I would make in this discussion is that the Civil War was the second most important and defining moment in our history after the Declaration of Independence and the Revolutionary War, and that it must be remembered and remembered within its proper context. That war changed how we referred to ourselves. We went from these United States to the United States, and we're proud to say so. It's important to remember the Confederate Army officers viewed themselves before, during, and after the war as Americans. They, were felt, they felt they were carrying on the tradition of Washington and Jefferson. I do not believe they were traitors. Well, that's my two cents, and thanks for joining me out here.